Our next speaker is Dr. Pam Popper. Hey! Come on. I know you had lunch. You probably had a few of those desserts. That, that was a good lunch. That, that was a Joel Furman lunch. Dr. Popper uh, was a, also involved as part of Meals for Health in Sacramento, the Sacramento Food Bank. And when Dr. Popper came in to speak, and she, I think she spoke about women's issues on that time, which was, which was great and very appropriate because I think it was 75% women that were doing that program. And one of the reactions that they had is, oh my God, you're, you're perfect, you're a woman. <laughs> so I feel the same way about having Pam today. Dr. Popper is a naturopath and internationally recognized expert on nutrition, health, and the executive director of the Wellness Forum. The Wellness Forum is a company which is, I guess, has chains and has uh, branches in different areas. Um, it offers educational programs designed to assist individuals in changing their health outcomes through improved diet and lifestyle habits. She works with companies, employers, uh, to reduce the costs of health care. And uh, she's the author of several books. She's got a new book called Solving America's Healthcare Crisis, which we have and which we're going to be selling right after her talk out there. And I hope Dr. Popper will be, be able to uh, sign for people. Um, she's also part of PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. She's on the Physician Steering Committee. Uh, yeah. She's also part of Rip Esselstyn's Whole Foods Immersion Team. She is part of Dr. T. Colin Campbell's teaching team at Cornell. Uh, she's appeared in a number of films, including my film, Process People. She's in Forks Over Knives. Uh, yeah, I think she did a lot of the research for that film, if I'm not mistaken. She's in the film Making a Killing. She's a uh, public policy expert and a lobbyist for healthy food and testifies before Congress, is involved in both state and national federal uh, issues in this. Uh, she is a no BS person who tells it straight and uh, is, uh, occupies a part of this uh, area of uh, healthy living that, uh, uh, that is growing, that she is, uh, what am I trying to say? She has uh, spreading this message across many states. I highly recommend her newsletter and subscribing to her forum. Now you're gonna find out why I do. Please welcome Dr. Pam Popper. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am an outspoken person, as some of you may know, and I was asked on a radio show not too long ago, um, who are your detractors? And I said, well, pretty much everybody loves me except for the agricultural organizations and the food manufacturers. The FDA, the USDA, most professional associations like the American Medical Association and the American Dietetic Association, most of the disease groups, but other than that, I'm a very popular girl. So. <laughs> So anyway, um, and that's some of what we're going to talk about today in terms of looking at confusing research. You know, I've, I've been eating a plant-based diet for 17 years, and I've been in this business for 15 years. And in fact, this year is our company's 15th year anniversary. And uh, I look at, I've had a lot of experience working with people, and it's pretty easy, and I think you've seen that this weekend, to present a lot of really good scientific data that shows people why they should adopt a plant-based diet. I mean, how many of you got it pretty fast when you saw the evidence, right? All right. And I also think it's pretty easy to show people convenient ways and, and economical ways to adopt this diet. And people love the food, and it's not that hard to make. And once you get through the transition period, uh, it's easy to maintain. So that's not really where our problem is, in my opinion. I mean, maybe we have a problem getting the word out to more people. But, but to the extent that we reach people, we reach them and we show them what to do. I think where the problem is, is once you are convicted about this, um, there are issues associated with maintaining that conviction when you start interacting with the rest of the population. How many of you, for example, sometime during your journey to better health um, have felt um, a little shaky when somebody said, but I saw a study that said that if you don't drink milk, 
You know, you're gonna, your bones are gonna crumble, and my gosh, you have to give it to your children. Does anybody have just that little pang of doubt, you know? Um, and if you're, if you may not get enough protein, or um, that uh, people in China really don't eat any soy foods, and you start hearing all this, this distracting information, and some of it actually comes from some pretty credible people in terms of their training and the initials after their name, and it shakes your conviction a little bit. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is sorting through some of the confusion about diet and health and, and helping you to be able to maintain your convictions so that you're not subject to what I call the tyranny of the latest study or the headlines that shake your confidence in what you're doing. So here are my goals for, this is what we're gonna cover in the next hour or so. Um, we're gonna talk about the various influences on dietary recommendations and how what you hear about every day is influenced. Um, how to develop what I call a personal nutritional philosophy. In other words, I think that people that do well at anything, whether it's saving money or planning how to take care of their health and how they're going to eat, have a very solid, well thought out philosophy. So I'll talk about that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how others develop erroneous views uh, so that you can understand where they're coming from some of the sources of misinformation and then how a lay person, some of you have medical training and this is gonna be a lot easier for you, but how a lay person can start to look at research and determine whether or not it's something you should be paying attention to because there is a lot of research uh, published today and some of it is very, very good and some of it leaves a lot to be desired and I'll give you some examples of both. So what has led to so much misinformation? And I think we could talk about just this all day long, but I think the major factors are that there is a lot of interest in diet and health today, um, more than ever before. And um, with that brings a lot of problems. One of them is the influence of money on research, nutrition policies, health recommendations, national disease groups, and others, and we'll spend a lot of time on that because if you follow the money, you find out why a lot of people say some of the things that they do. There is a lot of money to be made by developing books and, and programs that um, are different, and, and I um, get aggravated at this sometimes, but one day when we were just sitting around at the wellness farm talking about how we could get rich quick, because you can't unless you come up with some crazy idea, I think sometimes, but we decided that we would come up with a, a new diet book and it would be called the Social Security Number Diet. Okay, and I figured this would make me very famous. And so here's the way the social security number diet would work. You would add up the numbers of your social security number and divide by two. And if you got an even number, then um, you would eat legumes on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And an odd number, you would eat legumes on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And you guys all know you should never eat legumes on Sunday, correct? Right. All right. Well, that's a crazy idea, but it's really not any crazier than some of the other things that I see people promoting these days. It's just different enough that there's probably a whole population of people out there that would say, that sounds kind of interesting. Gosh, I haven't tried that before. Maybe I'll try it. I probably would be on, you know, The Tonight Show or something like that promoting it at some point. And so there is this really uh, incentive to develop a new idea. And if you can come up with a way to give people what John McDougal calls good advice about their bad habits, that always sells well. And if you look at some of the programs that gain some traction, part, traction part of it is because they give people permission to practice their bad habits. So the main sources of misinformation are, first of all, government. And I don't know if this is new for you. Has anybody ever heard of the government not telling the truth about things? Or is this the first, <laughs> first time you've ever heard about that, right? Um, national and international health organizations. I, I wish that I could tell you that it's different in other places, but it's not, and I'll show you why. Uh, healthcare professionals, organizations, well-meaning but misinformed healthcare professionals, who I think the big problem not right now is that just that they're victims of their training. We're just not teaching healthcare professionals the right things and that's one of the reasons we started our own school at the Wellness Forum. We own the Wellness Forum Institute for Health Studies because we want to train nutrition and healthcare professionals differently and in a manner that really reflects what works uh, for people and, and to promote health. Um, misleading research and then the media's interpretation of research. There's so much interest in diet and health right now that it's in every newspaper, every magazine, every day on television there's something. And so I think many times a lot of people who are interested in nutrition are reporting it, but not necessarily the best equipped to evaluate the, the research. And then advertising disguised as health messages. And it happens in some very obvious ways and then some not 
not so obvious ways that I'll show you. So I'll start real briefly with one that you're familiar with, and Dr. Barnard covered it on Friday night, and that's the United States Department of Agriculture, which was actually formed under Abraham Lincoln's administration, and it was formed as an advocacy organization for farmers. And I have said from the get-go, my problem is not that we have a USDA because I think farming is a big part of our society, it's a big part of our economy. The problem is that this organization is also charged with developing dietary guidelines for Americans, and if we could just let these people do what they do and it didn't affect so many things, I wouldn't be so concerned about it, but whatever the USDA comes up with, this gets translated into what our kids eat in schools, uh, what our troops eat when they're stationed overseas or at bases here in the United States, what goes into nutrition textbooks and what dietitians are taught as part of their curriculum. So uh, this is a very influential set of dietary guidelines. And the current guidelines are just as bad as the ones that came before it. And I loved when Dr. Barnard said that the saying at PCRM is it's good, but it's not good enough. It may be better, but it's not better enough. And that's certainly what happened this time when the guidelines came out. And I took this right off of the USDA website, and I'll just point out a couple of things. Um, and these are direct quotes. Consume less than 10% of calories from saturated fat and consume more monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat. In other words, they're really saying eat more fat. Now, some of you are doctors in the audience, and I don't know about your practice, but I don't have people coming into my office that need to eat more fat. That's not a recommendation we hand out very often in our office. I mean, the only people we talk to about that are people with eating disorders. Um, reduce the intake of calories from solid fats and added sugars. How about if we would, would eliminate it? Doesn't that sound like a better plan based on what you've learned here? But the term is reduce. Consume at least half of all grains as whole grains, which means that the other half can be Pop-Tarts. I don't understand. <laughs> Increase the increase intake of fat-free or low-fat milk and milk products such as milk, yogurt, cheese, or fortified soy beverages. Gosh, we gotta get that milk in no matter what. Choose a variety of protein foods, and the first ones listed are animal foods, and then increase the amount and variety of seafood consumed by choosing seafood in place of some meat and poultry. And um, I don't have anybody coming into my office suffering from a seafood deficiency. Again, I don't know about the rest of you that are in practice, but we just don't see this at, you know, on a daily basis. So it really should be about reducing or eliminating uh, certain foods. And I think this is the reason why we're never gonna see good guidelines come from the USDA or from our federal government is because if we started saying the right thing to the public, we'd have to see, say, eat more of this, eat less of that, and eat none of these foods over here. And eat less messages do not play well with agricultural organizations and food companies. They don't like it at all. It is the same in other countries. In fact, um, I had the pleasure of speaking in South Africa in January. And about a month before I left for South Africa, I started re revising some of my slide presentations, like this one, because this is a talk I've given several times. And I thought it was going to be a lot of work to do this, and so I started with you know, lots of time to spare. And I started looking at the government guidelines in South Africa. It's exactly the same. In fact, one of, one of the dietary guidelines is that it says something to the effect that um, with new urbanization, with, with more people moving into the cities, this is a great opportunity for people to eat meat, more meat and dairy products so that they can enjoy better health. That's on the South African website. And I teach a class through our school called Nutritional Issues and Controversies, and I was taking some stuff off of other countries' websites like Australia and China blatantly promoting the consumption of more meat and dairy products. So it's not just in the United States, this is a pervasive problem worldwide. And in fact, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations is not much better. Here is some of the fabulous innovative advice that comes from their website. Various dietary patterns can be consistent with good health. Okay, that tells you just what to do, doesn't it? Um, enjoy a variety of foods, okay. Eat to meet your needs, that tells me a lot. Uh, protect the quality and safety of your food and keep active and stay foot, fit. Well, I'll tell you one glance at that and it would tell you exactly how to eat a health-promoting diet. I mean, this is a lot of effort to come up with dietary guidelines that are completely meaningless and one of the reasons is the power of agricultural groups worldwide to make sure that nobody is getting the dreaded eat less message, which, um, which which is, they don't like to hear that at all. Now, um, for any group that I pick on today, uh, there are many I could pick on, but because they only allow me an hour and 15 minutes, I had to select. <laughs> this is actually a 16-hour lecture, but I have a plane at 10.40 tonight, so we had to rein it in a little bit. Um, 
the heart checkmark program comes from the American Heart Association, and you can see by the appearance of it, doesn't it look sort of official? And if you are a cardiac patient, wouldn't this give you some reassurance? And so um, this program, by the way, has been around for a long period of time, and manufacturers pay a lot of money in order to get their products approved. So um, I have looked at this again and again, and I cannot figure out what the criteria is, because uh, here are some of the things. I took this right off of their website last week. It's very current. Uh, under canned meat and poultry, premium chunk chicken breast and roast beef and beef broth. And okay, that doesn't sound so bad, but let's go to the next one. Boar's Head brand branded deluxe 42% lower sodium ham, because if you have cardiovascular disease, there's nothing better for you than lower sodium ham. Um, the ones I love are the Butterball Original Deep Fried Chicken Breast, which we know is great for people with coronary artery disease, and Butterball Original Deep Fried Turkey Breast Thanksgiving Style, which just has to be even better than the original kind. Healthy Choice Round Four Cheese Pizza, Healthy Choice Select Entrees Bacon and Smoky Cheddar Chicken. These are Heart Association approved foods. Kroger Sliced Canadian Bacon with Natural Juices, and bacon with natural juices is so much better for you, I just want you to know if you're trying to make some. And then Great Value Smoked Brown Sugar Ham. And there are hundreds and hundreds of products. And they're very proud of the fact, by the way, that they don't endorse any desserts. Okay, they're that, that, you know, boldly displayed. And, and that's probably because you're comatose after eating the Canadian bacon and natural juices. You can't get to the desserts. But, and, and, I'm, and they all do it. The American Diabetes Association, their health tip of the day for 18 months was sponsored by Eskimo Pie. Now there is some good food for diabetics, all right? They took a million and a half dollars from Cadbury Schweppes, which not only is the third largest maker of soft drinks in the world, but makes those little cream eggs that you get at Easter time, and that also is some very good food for diabetics. Now. I'll clarify and tell you that I think that a lot of people who work for these organizations show up at work every day wanting to do the right thing, but it's impossible to do it with these types of conflicts of interest. And so when you're talking to a diabetic friend, when you're talking to a friend who has coronary artery disease and you're trying to tell them what you learned this weekend at this conference, and they're pushing back and saying, my cardiologist is the best in Denver, Colorado, or wherever the person lives, and my cardiologist says it's okay to eat turkey breast, in fact, it can eat even be fried. Understand where that person's coming from. They're getting it from what is perceived to be a very, very credible source. And that's why it's hard sometimes to get through to people. Um, professional associations, they all do it. We could just as easily have slides up here about the American Academy of Pediatrics or any other group, but the American Dietetic Association represents 70,000 dietitians who should be focused on giving Americans the very best nutritional advice, and in fact, some of them are. We have some of them here today. Juliana Hever is an incredibly enlightened dietitian who I feel comfortable referring anybody to um, because she actually follows the science, and I wish all dietitians do. Unfortunately, they don't, and one of the reasons is conflict of interest. Um, I pulled in 2008, I got a hold of the American Dietetic Association's annual report, and their sponsors include, they're close to $2 million here in 2008 from Coca-Cola, the National Dairy Council, Council Pepsi-Cola, General Mills, Kellogg, Mars, um, the American Beverage Association, and Post Cereals. So it's really hard to give objective information about health without upsetting sponsors like this. And so has anybody ever heard about moderation? Okay, everybody says, when you're trying to tell them don't eat bacon and natural juices, and they're going, oh, come on, everything in moderation is okay, right? Well, that's where these messages come from, is the American Dietetic Association, and you can go to their website and look for yourself, says that there are no good and bad foods, there's room for all foods in a healthy diet, and there are no good or bad dietary patterns. Everybody sort of has to figure out what they want to eat. And does anybody believe that that's true? Well, you don't because you've been here for a weekend or you've been coming to a lot of events like this and you've read a lot of books and you really are convicted about what you know, but it helps you to understand where some of the bad information is coming from and why your friends and relatives push back. And then healthcare professionals training. Um, most doctors don't really get much nutrition information in school, and I think that nutrition professionals really don't learn much about how to treat people with diet. Therapeutic diets are not really focused on. Um, I think strategies to manage disease are focused on, but there is, I, I know when I was in school, nobody told me you could cure somebody of diabetes. Nobody told me you could cure somebody of coronary artery disease. And so we have a lot of low expectations. In fact, I describe some of what goes 
goes on in the healthcare field as being a collision of low expectations from healthcare professionals who never learn that you could really cure people and patients who show up not knowing that they can be cured. So with those low expectations on both sides, it's no wonder that uh, public health is declining in this country. So I think a lot of inaccurate information is being distributed this way. And then misreporting by the media. Now, has anybody ever heard of the media misreporting things, or is this your first chance to hear something like that? Well, I'll give you an example of how things can be skewed. And, and one piece of advice I'll give you is if you read something in a magazine, even if it's a magazine that normally is pretty reputable and it doesn't sound right to you, go look it up. I mean, actually look at the study. And fortunately, the internet allows almost everybody to gain access to this sort of thing right now. But you might have heard a few years ago a landmark study or a landmark presentation showing that coffee is a good source of antioxidants. Do you remember that? And every time these kinds of things hit, my email box fills up with people saying, well, you know, what do you have to say about that? You're telling everybody not to do this and not to do that. And uh, so I started digging into this a little bit, and the articles that came out were based on a presentation that was made at the American Chemical Society. And during this presentation, 100 foods and beverages common in the American diet were analyzed for antioxidant content and compared to the USDA's consumption patterns um, for those foods. And the presenter never said that coffee was a health food or even that it was a good source of antioxidants. What the researchers said was that coffee contains antioxidants and that the American diet is so bad that coffee had become an important source of antioxidants in the diet. Now, does everybody understand the difference between that statement and coffee is a good source of antioxidants? So I'm saying that so you all don't run to Starbucks during my presentation here since it's right down the hall. But um, you know, a, a list of foods with antioxidant content were shown and coffee was way down on the list. His point was not that it was a great thing to consume. It's just that it had become a primary source of antioxidants in the diet. So I've gotten to the place now where when I read about something in the New York Times, Forbes Magazine, USA Today, it doesn't really matter where, I want to go back and read the original study. I want to see what really got said. And it is amazing how many times I go to the original document and it's completely different from what we've been told. Um, now we get into some misleading research and how stru studies are structured. It is very difficult, and I think we have to acknowledge this, to study structures on diet and health. And I think there's way too much focus on studying one food or one nutrient, and this is where things can get really confusing. And a good example of how this happens is that um, people will, somebody will structure a study where half of the participants in the study consume an extra serving of soy a day, and the other ones don't, and they conclude at the end of the day that there's no real protective benefit of soy foods. Well, I, if you look at the doctors that you hear from at these conferences and, and uh, those that, that are promoted through VegSource, all of us are producing the results that we're producing by looking at total dietary pattern, not individual foods and nutrients. And in fact, one of the things that I tell people all the time who come into our office in Columbus is that uh, diet is like a combination lock. If it takes four numbers to open a combination lock and you dial up three of them and not the fourth, you do not get 75% of the results. You get zero, correct? You have to get that fourth number right in order to get results. And so a lot of the studies that are out there talking about individual foods and nutrients feed into this idea that if you just added a nutrient in your diet every day, if you just added a food into your diet every day, you would somehow be better. And it never works. I mean, I never see any studies that show that the addition of a food or nutrient are really changing health in significant ways. And so this is one thing that leads people to say after they experiment around with a lot of different foods and nutrients that maybe diet doesn't have such a profound influence on health because they're really not, not looking at the whole dietary pattern. Um, as we get into structuring research on diet, people eat lots of different foods in different combinations. Even in the same country or area, there can be some variations. Other lifestyle factors are important and it's hard for it to control for those things. Um, in a lot of situations, subjects are given a dietary protocol, sometimes with, sometimes without training, sometimes with, sometimes without follow-up. They have to follow the diet with limited amount of support. 
And then a major situation that we have to deal with all the time is self-reported data. Um, and what this means is that people fill out questionnaires or they talk to researchers on the phone and talk about what they eat. And research has actually shown that what people will do, and I don't know if it's an attempt to um, impress the researchers or where it comes from, but they'll overstate the good foods and understate the bad foods. So instead of saying, yeah, to be honest, I went on a binge and had 12 Krispy Kreme donuts, they'll say, I had one donut and an extra extra helping of salad. Well, you can see how even minor deviations like that will skew results. So self-reported data is, is very difficult. And one thing I want to point out, and I think it's a point that often gets missed, how many of you have read the China study? Okay. Um, when people are talking to you about research, one thing that Colin did in the China study is when they were, when they were looking at the dietary habits of all those 6,500 Chinese people, the researchers actually recorded what the people ate. It was not self-reported data a few days or a few weeks later. Exactly what the people ate was recorded by a researcher in the home. So it was as accurate as, as it could possibly be. And this has not been done in very many studies before. It's a big differentiating factor between the research that Colin did and what we see under normal circumstances. Um, study design is really important. Uh, one thing that frustrates me is that, I'm going to give you a specific a, a couple of examples here in a second, is that often you've got two groups of people eating diets and one group is supposed to be eating a healthier diet than the other group, but the group eating the healthier diet is not eating a healthier enough diet to make a difference. Um, we see this with fat consumption, for example. The low fat group is consuming 29% of fat from calories, and that's really not a low fat diet. So it's not surprising that the people consuming 29% of, of calories from fat are not ending up better off than the group consuming 35% of calories from fat. And so I'll give you a couple of examples. And this is the stuff that I think sort of shakes people up a little bit. And I know because I get a thousand emails a day and I would say that about a hundred of them pertain to these kinds of issues every single day. So I know this is going on because I deal with it. So in March of 2009, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition reported the results of a study showing that vegetarians don't live longer than meat eaters. Now does that surprise you a little bit? Okay, how, how could this possibly be? Well, the study compared vegetarians and non-vegetarians with similar lifestyles. The problem was the definition of vegetarian, and in this case, the definition of vegetarian was a person who didn't eat meat or fish. But we all know that there are a lot of vegetarians that eat eggs, dairy, oils, high-fat foods, correct? I mean, some of you know the story of my chef who arrived at the Wellness Forum weighing 475 pounds, and he was a vegan, okay? So um, you have to, it's, you, you're obviously doing something wrong on a vegan diet if you weigh 475 pounds. So based on this loose definition of vegetarian, is it any surprise that the vegetarians didn't seem to have better health outcomes than the non-vegetarians? I mean, now we understand how that can happen. But when the press gets a hold of this, two, two or three things happen. First of all, your meat-eating friends email this to you when it comes out on a news. Have, have you all had that happen? See, you're going to all this trouble to deprive yourself because what we really know is that you sit and watch me eat cheese pizza and wish you were doing it too. That's your friend talking to you, right? Um, and, and there's nothing good coming out of it because vegetarians actually don't do any better, so maybe you should start eating cheese pizza with me. So that's the first thing that happens that's aggravating to all of you, and maybe if you're new to this, might shake you up a little bit. And then the second thing that happens is the news media grabs onto it and says all this talk about diet, and the drug companies, I think, capitalize on it too. All this talk about diet, it's really not very worthwhile. It's genetic, let's face it, it's in your genes, correct? And what you need is drugs, not diet, because the diet stuff just doesn't work. Here's a study that says so, and it's in a really good journal that we all respect. Now here's another one that happened that caused a lot of ruckus, and I got a lot of, um, the emails I got on this were from, from people who were confused and also some healthcare professionals who don't like me who were saying, see, <clears throat> you're absolutely wrong about this. This headline was on Yahoo News Canada in 2009, uh, Vegetarian Diet Weakens Bones, and the article began with this statement, people who live on vegetarian diets have slightly weaker bones than their meat-eating counterparts. Now, if you're a new convert to this diet and you just took your kids off of milk and your pediatrician beat you up for it, it, you can probably understand how this might shake you up just a tiny little bit. That's why people write to me. So digging into it a little further, I found out that a dairy organization in Malaysia funded the study. 
Okay, that might be a consideration to take, that might be something worth taking into consideration. The study was actually a meta-analysis of nine studies which were selected from a total of 922. Now I'll make this point again, but I wanna, you can't make it too many times. Nine studies out of 922 cannot be considered a report of the preponderance of the evidence. Would everybody agree with that? So, so that's a major problem. The so, um, and then the next thing was the analysis found that the bones of the vegetarians were 5% less dense and for vegans, 6% um, less dense. And here's what the lead researcher wrote about it. He stated that although the studies show that vegetarian and vegan diets are associated with lower bone mineral density, quote, the magnitude of the association is clinically insignificant. It meant the results were meaningless. So how did the study get so much attention? Well, what happens when industry groups fund a study is they take the results and they publicize it. So it wasn't the journal that published this article that caused all the um, publicity and all that sort of thing. It was the dairy organization in Malaysia that promoted this study as being significant. So again, this is why you can't get all shook up every time you see something on the internet or you read something in a newsletter, you really need to go to the source and check it out. Here's another one that uh, I must have gotten a, a thousand emails over a six or seven week period of time about. This was a couple of years ago, or maybe last year, the Journal of the National Cancer Institute published an article online in which researchers reported that eating more fruits and vegetables daily did not significantly reduce the risk of cancer. Now, does that sound a little counterintuitive based on what you know? All right, so the researchers, and this is how it gets even worse in terms of sorting it out. This represented close to a half a million people who were followed in European countries for 8.7 years, so we can't blame it on small sample size. And they assessed, the researchers associated, assessed the association between cancer risk and fruit and vegetable consumption, and this was a quote from the article, high intake of vegetables and fruits and vegetables combined was associated with a small reduction in overall cancer risk. So I started looking into it. After I get about the 50th email about the same thing is when I think, okay, I better check this out. And so Scientific American actually published a counter to this online. And what they said is the researchers concluded that if the results of the analysis can be broadly applied, upping daily fruit and vegetable consumption by about 150 grams, which is the equivalent of a cup of cherry tomatoes or one and a half extra bananas, um, the uh, cancer rate would only go down by about two and a half percent. Well, first of all, the cancer rate's high enough that two and a half percent might be worth talking about. But the other thing is nobody here this weekend told you that if you ate an extra cup of cherry tomatoes or an extra banana, your health was gonna improve, right? What did everybody here tell you? You had to convert to a plant-based diet. You gotta get all four numbers of the combination lock. So again, many times when you delve into what's behind a lot of these studies and who sponsored them and what they actually said, you come up with a different conclusion. And then there's industry funding. One of the most um, uh, blatant violators is the dairy industry. And one of the things the dairy industry has claimed for years is that you can lose weight eating dairy products. And they actually do have two studies that show that they were done by a researcher at the University of Tennessee by the name of Frank Zemmel. He was paid $1.7 million to do those two studies. And um, he also received, uh, during that same period of time, about $275,000 from General Mills. He's patented a weight loss program that's now licensed to the Nat National, National Dairy Association, and advertisers pay to participate in his uh, calcium key program of $50,000 a year. So how do you feel about his study now? Okay, not so important. But here's where it gets really interesting. Amy Lanou and Neil Barnard looked at the results of clinical trials evaluating dairy and weight loss and found that um, there was no connection. In fact, if anything, dairy increased weight gain, not decreased or facilitated weight loss. And in fact, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine sued the dairy industry based on this claim. And in 2007, the Federal Trade Commission ruled that the research didn't support the industry's weight loss claims. And in spite of that, they still testified in front of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee that people needed to drink more milk in order to facilitate weight loss. But again, industry funding can have uh, a profound effect. 
Um, hiring experts. How many people have been dismayed to see that somebody associated with Yale or Harvard has come out and said something completely ridiculous in terms of diet or health? And um, this came from a handbook, actually. I listed it on the slide of how to get um, how to get endorsements for your products and to inoculate yourself against negative publicity. And I won't read it, but what it basically says is that what you want to do is go out and hire all the experts that you can. Be very careful to not disclose to them your strategy. And you hire them to write favorable things about your products, and one of the benefits is that then it's hard for them to write negative things about your product later on. Okay, so. Um that's one way that experts get drafted into saying good things about products and become part of the problem. Uh, the other thing that goes on a lot is funding for academic departments, research institutes, professional societies. One that you might know about is that Pepsi Cola funded a huge research center in South Haven near Yale. And it's not actually affiliated with Yale Medical School, but they give $250,000 fellowships to Yale medical students to work at the research center to improve the health of foods or the health value of foods like Cheetos and Fritos. And you can see that that's very valuable research that needs to be done, right? Um, uh, food companies support meetings and conferences and journals, and, and most nutrition professionals depend on this type of funding. Um, journals are a big issue, and here's a little trick I'll teach you about journals. Corporate sponsorships are used to defray costs, and so for example, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition has 28 corporate sponsors that include Coca-Cola, Slim Fast, and the Sugar Association. And the American Dietetics Association takes in millions every year from its journal. And so what happens is this. Industry Industry will sponsor conferences, and I'll give you an example in a second, at which papers are presented about the health benefits of certain foods. And then um, they're published by the journals in something in a supplement form. And you can tell because the citation has an S after it. So it's really not the Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It's a supplement to the Journal of Clinical Nutrition. But the dairy industry, the sugar association, the food companies will then take reprints, sometimes millions of reprints of those journals, and then um, uh, post them online, mail them to influential people. So it looks like the Journal of Clinical Nutrition is advocating the use of Pepsi or some other product. At conferences, and this is how a lot of this stuff goes on, food companies buy ads and programs and booths, and in fact, at the American Diabetic Dietetic Association's 2000 conference, the Distilled Spirits Council presented a, workshops, a workshop on the risks and benefits of alcohol, Slim Fast on obesity prevention and uh, treatment, Benacol, a workshop on cholesterol lowering, because we all know that if you ate more margarine, you would be better off, right? And then Quaker and Gatorade did a workshop on athletes. Uh, so everybody kind of understanding how this gets all mixed up and why some of your friends think they're doing the right thing when they're doing the wrong thing, or your family members for that, for that matter. Kashi markets, uh, based on liberal labeling laws, they now have a cracker that's fortified with plant sterols, and they actually say in their ads, it's the first cracker that, improve, that can improve your heart health. So if only it were true, you could go home and eat crackers and improve your cardiovascular health. And then Pepsi-Cola uses this designation they call Smart Spot. And these are all industry designations that come from the companies themselves. And their lo this logo, this Smart Spot logo, appears on Diet Pepsi, Diet Mountain Dew, Baked Cheetos, Doritos, and Lay's Potato Chips. Those are Smart Spot foods. Um, Kraft has a sensible solution line of products that contains like more fiber, more calcium. And those products include Kool-Aid, and Velveeta cheese food. Those are considered sensible solutions. Now, where this becomes important is a lot of times we, we have a foundation that does work in schools. When we go in schools to change the, the food in schools, some of what happens is there's so much misunderstanding by the parents, the teachers, the administration based on these kinds of designations. Like they don't understand why Quaker Oats chewy granola bars with chocolate chips isn't a health food because it looks like a health food. It's fortified with some different things and uh, different nutrients and that sort of thing. So these companies deliberately do this to make their foods look better to uneducated people, and that's why you get resistance, for example, in a school environment. So let's get into some rules for evaluating information, couple tips how to do it. The first thing is I think you have to look for people who don't take money. Um, and I've been in business for 15 years. During that period of time, I haven't taken any money from manufacturers or food organizations, lobbying groups, anybody, in exchange for endorsements or statements about anything. And that, that's why I can stand up here and take shots at everybody. I don't work for them, I work for you. And that's a whole different story. So um, if you go to our website, you'll see right on the front page, it says research and science, not stories and advertising. 
And I've been offered a lot of money. And believe me, when I had two kids in college, and at one point in time, I was in college, and my youngest daughter was in college, and our tuition bills were $63,000 a year between the two of us, I was thinking a lot when I said no to this kind of thing. But I really knew in my heart it was the right thing to do to not get tied up with these companies and organizations financially. Another thing is never, and, and by the way, the people that you're hearing from here, they're not taking money from groups either. Dr. Furman maintains his independence, Dr. McDougall, Rip Esselstyn. These people maintain their independence so that what they're telling you um, is, is really unbiased. Never rely on one study. Um, you have to read lots of studies on a given topic and rely on the preponderance of the evidence. And for almost all topics that have been well researched, not all of them point, not all the studies point in the same direction. Um, so I'll give you an example. I could get up here today and I could give you a presentation on the idea that smoking does not increase your risk of lung cancer. And I could use citations from the Journal of the American Medical Association and the New England Journal of Medicine, and you think, well, gosh, maybe I should rethink that, that whole thing, because I certainly thought it did. The problem is that most studies show that smoking increases your risk of lung cancer. And so it would be very deceptive of me to handpick a couple of studies that prove my point and ignore the vast body of evidence that proves something else. And that's a common strategy used by many of our colleagues who are either not great researchers, that's maybe being kind, or actually have a hidden agenda. So let's look at an example that you probably run into often, um, dairy and calcium. 141 studies have been published since 1975 examining the theory that milk, dairy, and calcium supplementation reduce the risk of osteoporotic fractures, and 47 studies do support this theory. But 19 studies were inconclusive, and 75 studies showed that milk, dairy, and calcium supplements do not improve bone health. In other words, one-third of the studies support the dairy-calcium link, two-thirds of the studies do not. So can you find a study that shows that dairy products are good for you? Yes. But the problem is, most studies show a different outcome. And for this to change, we would have to have close to 100 new studies showing a positive relationship and no new studies showing a negative relationship. Highly unlikely. Would everybody agree with that? And that's why we can say with a great deal of confidence that dairy products and calcium supplements are not good for your bones. But again, if I wanted to come up here and give you reasons to consume dairy, I'd cherry pick from the 47 studies that are favorable to dairy products, not tell you that there are close to 100 studies showing a different outcome and leave you with a totally different impression. Um, the structure of research studies makes a huge difference. How many of you have encountered the Weston Price Foundation someplace along the way and have received emails from people s uh, saying things like the dark side of soy and if you consume soy you're going to die early and your children are going to develop, your male children are going to develop breasts by the age of three and all these frightening horrible things. Well, if you go to the Weston Price Foundation, they actually have posted 23 pages of studies that theoretically are supposed to convince you that soy is a terrible food. So, I actually took some of those studies from the 23 pages, and you can go there and look at them yourselves, the, yourself, the whole lot of them, it's easy to find. So here's a study that was published in 1953, and it says, soy and levels intended to simulate unheated soy flour after being fed to rats was found to possibly cause an enforced limitation of food intake with a consequent impairment of growth. Do you find that really convincing? Yeah, not so much. Okay, 1959. The author took three cases of goiter in children in which the thyroid enlargement was apparently related to intake of a soybean milk. Two of the three children were switched to solid foods and cow's milk and their goiters grew smaller. You feel really convinced by that? Okay. Um, 1970. There was a frequent occurrence of foot pad dermatitis in turkeys fed soybean meal pulse, whereas the occurrence was rare in turkeys fed a diet containing casein, gelatin, and corn. And I have always found that um, the occurrence of foot pad dermatitis in humans is very much an issue we should be concerned about. But I mean, do you see what is happening here? Does, it, does the, any of this sound like it is convincing to you? I'm just curious. Um, now here's one that I think is amazing. These two actually appear right together in this massive 23-page document. Soy is listed as a minor source of protein in Japanese and Chinese diets. Major sources of protein listed were meat, including organ meats, poultry, fish, and eggs. Asians throughout the world have high rates of thyroid cancer. Does it sound like soy is the problem? 
What does it sound like is the problem? They almost list studies that prove our point, not theirs. And then soy feeding caused damage to small bowel mucosa in two infants. And, and here's the thing, what you're looking at here is case reports and case series. And case reports are published by medical journals without much documentation. In other words, if I find something interesting going on in my office, I can write up a patient's story without um, anybody else documenting it, probably redact the name of the patient and send it to a journal. If they find it interesting, they would publish it. But is that a scientific study? Not so much. The reason why journals do this is because if there are enough case studies that, or case reports that look similar, it might stimulate somebody to do a proper research study to look at the issue. But first of all, you'd want to be very wary of page after page of citations that list animal studies only because we know, and this is something you can check out if you haven't already done so, that animal research doesn't always carry over into um, human health uh, applications. And the second thing is people who cite case studies that's really stories, not science. And this group is famous for that. So that's one of the, if, if this is an example, the next time you get one of these things that says uh, the dark side of soy. So go, go to the source, look at the information. I'm confident that if you go read all 23 pages of it, you'll go buy some tofu and make yourself a good stir fry tonight after you, after you do it. And I don't think it'll convince anybody. Um, another issue that we deal with in research is correlation versus cause and effect relationship. And correlation means that two things exist at the same time, but one doesn't cause the other. And Colin Campbell uses a great example in the China study that I like to use. He calls it phone pulls and heart disease. I could actually prove to you, given enough time, that the more telephone pulls there are in a country, the higher the heart disease rate gets. And so somebody looking on the outside might make the observ observation that apparently telephone pulls cause heart disease. Now, does everybody understand that's ridiculous, right? Well, if we were to structure a really well-conducted uh, well study, we would find out that telephone pulls are indicative of westernization, correct? And westernization brings with it a dietary pattern that increases heart disease. And so when you're looking at research, you have to really look at who, who funded the study, how is it structured, and does it really show correlation or is it, um, uh, does it really show cause and effect relationship or does it just show cause uh, correlation? And this might seem really complicated, but when I teach classes at the Wellness Forum, this is something we teach our members to do. I mean, it goes beyond just teaching people the right diet. We try to teach them how to filter through information. Um, we'll use four or five examples and as soon as we, let them look at the abstracts and that sort of thing, they're able to pick it up really fast. Believe me, if you just go do some online research tonight, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, one issue is the vitamin D issue. There's a lot of dispute about this, uh, even amongst the plants-based community about vitamin D supplementation, but um, there is a lot of correlation. In other words, it is true that a lot of people who have autoimmune diseases and cancer have low vitamin D levels. But even the Institute of Medicine has said it's based on correlation, not cause and effect relationships. And that vitamin D supplementation wasn't recommended for that reason and because the benefits are not strong enough to outweigh the risks. So it's very important as you're reviewing information to see, is there, real, is there really a cause and effect relationship here? Is there a mechanism of action explained? I mean, can anybody explain how telephone poles would increase heart disease rates? No, there's no you know, mechanism of action. We can't really explain it. And then this is very, very important. Short-term changes in biomarkers are often the way that we evaluate health in this country. And so a good example of this, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's correlated with long-term improvements in health. And so a study was done where they looked at B vitamins. You know, B vitamins lower homocysteine levels, and homocysteine levels are a marker for cardiovascular disease. And it is true, in this study, they showed that B vitamins did lower homocysteine levels in the, subject, in the participants in the study. The problem was it didn't reduce the risk of heart attack in the uh, participants in the study. Statin drugs lower uh, cholesterol, but the risk profile for heart attack or all-cause mortality does not change very much. Fish oil increases HDL levels. The problem is that increased HDL levels don't correlate well and are not related to a uh, better risk profile for heart attack, stroke, or all-cause mor mortality. So what happens with um, a lot of research is that it tracks short-term results in biomarkers rather than long-term health outcomes. And, and we have this new phenomenon. I took this from Dr. McDougal. He talks about people dying with great blood work. And, and Tim Russert is a good example of how this whole method of thinking can become so misdirected. 
Here's a guy that was a news anchor at CBS News. He was wealthy, he had great insurance, he went to all the right doctors, he took all the right drugs for his pre-diabetic condition, his uh, cholesterol, his blood pressure, and he took an aspirin every day, and he still died of a heart attack at the age of 58, because none of those drugs addressed what killed him, which was unstable plaques throughout his body, one of which ruptured and caused the heart attack that caused the end of his life. And the reality is that if he had been taking supplements, Instead of drugs, he, took, he could have taken, for example, red rice yeast extract for his cholesterol, high-dose cinnamon for his diabetic condition, and uh, hawthorn berry for his blood pressure. He'd still be a dead guy with great blood work. And that's not what you're really looking for. And so you compare this type of thing with Dr. Esselstyn's research, where he followed his patients for now 26 years, and Dr. Roy Swank who did research on diet and multiple sclerosis patients and followed his original patient group for 34 years. Do you see the difference between that type of research and the type of research where we changed a biomarker? You know, 13 people at Tufts University experienced an increase in HDL level after taking fish oil pills. You know, my response to that is, who cares? Nobody's coming into my office wanting 28 days of health two weeks of health. People are coming into my office at the age of 40 and saying, I want to live to be 95. They're looking for the long term. They don't know how to articulate it, but that's what they actually want. So we're focused on long term results. And some programs work in the short term, but in the long term, they're disastrous. This is particularly true with high protein diets. And I get very tired of this line. Have you ever had somebody challenge you on this and they say, well, but it's working? Okay, I'm doing the HCG diet, and you're telling them how bad it is, and they go, but it's working, I'm losing weight. And so my response to that is if the only criteria that we use to evaluate a program is that it's working, I'll tell you some things that work. Like for weight loss, cocaine addiction works. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of cocaine in my, addicts in my office in the last several years, and they are all very skinny people, all right? And for the record, their cholesterol levels are real low, too. <laughs> But does that mean we should go out promoting cocaine addiction as a way to lose weight? Absolutely not. I mean, people, and I say, well, then, it, then we stop talking about it's working, and we look at long-term as well as short-term ramifications on health, and that changes the discussion entirely. Um, and this, back to research and science versus stories and advertising. A lot of popular books report stories of people who've lost weight. And I think stories are interesting. There are some stories in my book. And I, I think that that inspires people when you read about somebody who had cancer, when you read about somebody who had Crohn's disease. So I have patient stories in my book. But I also have 267 references in the back of my book. Okay, so the actual strength of the arguments that I make in my book are based on the research. The stories are decorative. But I read books that are written by some of my colleagues, and they're strictly story books, and I'm almost embarrassed for them that they don't take the time to document what they're saying. So stories are interesting. They can be inspirational, but we don't rely on stories alone to make important uh, decisions about health. So, here are some conclusions. Rely only on research and science. Stories are interesting, but don't base your decisions on them. Using reliable sources, you need to develop, to develop a philosophy of diet and health, and it can't, it can't be shaken by the latest headline. Um, the tyranny of the latest study, Amy Lanou says, is one of the problems. You, and if you are shaken up a little bit by something, do a little digging and find out more about the particular study that's caused the problem. Um, don't be swayed by the results of a single study. Don't believe most of what you read and hear about health, uh, particularly from the media. And um, before you change your mind about anything, always uh, uh, investigate and don't be so quick to change your mind. And, and, and if you can learn some of those basic rules and just learn to do a little research. And I think people don't do research sometimes because they're confident that they don't know how or they're going to be intimidated by it. But like I said, when we take people through this in our classes and we just show them three or four abstracts and say, now listen, wasn't that really pretty user friendly? You understood what it said. You don't need a medical degree. Uh, you, did you need a medical degree to evaluate those Weston Price examples I put up there? No. Everybody here in the audience understood exactly what was going on. So don't be intimidated so much. So I'd be happy to take some questions from the audience if you'd like with the remaining time we have, if you'd like to ask me anything at all. Hi, um, I was surprised by what you said about vitamin D. I thought it did have an effect on autoimmune diseases and helped a lot of things, taking a supplement. 
Um, not in what my research has shown. The, the, the um, Institute of Medicine convened a committee um, last year, or the year before, the report came out last year, to look at about a thousand studies that, that examine the role of vitamin D and calcium and needs in the diet, sources, etc. And the conclusion was not that vitamin D wasn't important, but that normal levels had been exaggerated, that there were lots of articles in the medical literature that showed a correlation between vitamin D and health, but not a cause and effect relationship. And again, I would be the first to agree. People with autoimmune diseases generally do have lower vitamin D levels, but we don't see them getting better with vitamin D supplementation. Again, that's not surprising because the single nutrient approach has never worked in, in any studies I've seen. So it's not fixing the problem. And, and um, the cause of the autoimmune disease, we don't really have a biological mechanism that connects vitamin D to it. Uh, we have a, a connection to uh, animal foods and dairy proteins and that sort of thing that I think has been pretty well documented. So um, I think the case for vitamin D has been overstated by a lot of people. Yes? I have a concern about uh, genetically modified uh, seeds. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me something about Monsanto and are they messing with soy bean seeds? Um, I'm trying to um, like soy, but I'm looking for genetically, I'm sorry, um, organic soy. Yeah, is it, there a difference? Yeah, I, I think there is. I, first of all, for the record, I'm not in favor of genetically modified foods. Um, I think that there, are, fortunately, there are some foods that tend to be more genetically modified more often than others, and uh, soy happens to be one of them. But also, fortunately, it's easy to find uh, organic soy foods, and organic soy foods are not genetically modified. So I have some concerns about them too. I think we're performing a grand experiment on the human population, which I don't agree with at all. So how about right down here, somebody in the front? And then we'll get to the other side. I oh. promise I'm not going to ignore you. <laughs> you I have you. the mic. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, since I have the mic and they don't, can I just okay. go ahead. Do you want to go um, next? I go promise ahead. I'll answer both. <laughs> um, it's great that uh, you're a naturopathic physician. I also happen to be a naturopathic physician. Um, but I'm a little disappointed in my profession in that <clears throat> despite all of their um, training in nutrition that relatively so few of them uh, adopt diet as a major way of approaching the health care of their patients and not very many of them really are swayed I think by the um, the vegetarian or vegan argument. Well, how would you respond to that? Uh, I agree with you and I wrote an article in, a news, in my newsletter about three weeks ago that generated a lot of hate mail. That's always when I know I'm onto something, when I get a lot of hate mail. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> it was really about uh, my article and I've spoken about this publicly a lot. I don't think the training naturopaths gets is any better than the training medical doctors get. Um, we're, tra we're taught to treat symptoms, not causes. And in terms of diet, um, we did get a lot of dietary training in school, but it really wasn't with any particular philosophy in mind. Uh, lots of diets for different people, and there's the Mediterranean diet, and there's the blood type diet, and there was really no focus on one being better than the other. It was just like you should know about all these different diets, and somehow that makes it better. So um, the other thing was there was a lot of focus on supplement uh, selling. and. Uh, what makes that whole thing worse is that doctors can't own pharmacies in their building to dispense drugs, but naturopaths can sell supplements. And um, it doesn't take very long when you graduate from school for all the supplement companies to start showing up telling you how much money you can make by selling supplements. And in an operation the size of mine, I could make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year if I was willing to do it. So I think that the financial interests influence naturopaths just as much as medical doctors in a different sort of way. And I think the training is just as abysmal. It's one of the reasons I started my own school. My goal, fortunately, I have two things going for me. I'm young enough to do it and I practice dietary excellence, so I'm going to live another 50 years. We're going to turn this into a full-fledged private college with a residential medical school, and we're going to set the standard for how nutrition and doc nutrition professionals and doctors are trained in this country. And that's, that's my plan for the future, and we're going to get it done. So thank you. And that's wonderful news, thank you. Um, could you say something about calcium supplementation? You, you kind of skirted over that 
earlier? Yeah, because we had to do 16 hours in an hour. So Jeff, how come I couldn't have the whole weekend that we could have covered it all? Um, yeah, I, I don't like for people to take supplement calcium supplements. We don't really have, the preponderance of the evidence does not show that they're beneficial for bone health. There are a couple of meta-analyses that are concerning to me that came out of New Zealand showing that calcium supplementation in amounts of about a 500 milligram pill a day increased the risk of heart attack by about 30%. So with no proven benefit based on the preponderance of the evidence and even the hint of that risk, it's simply not worth it. We take people off of supplements in general. And the way that we treat them in my office is the same way that we would treat a pharmaceutical drug. I mean, they're definitely useful for certain specific applications, but this idea of self-medicating at the health food store with your next door neighbor or on the internet is not, we don't think it's advisable. And by the way, that's one of the ways that you free up a whole lot of money to eat good food, is get rid of the monthly supplement bill and there's money to buy good food. Yes. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your presentation. Um, it's hard for me not to, when I think about the corruption, if you will, of um, you know, all these organizations that we depend upon for truth, if you will, um, to not get a little sad. And I'm wondering if you could maybe give us a, a little hope on what you're seeing, because it seems like the preponderance of the evidence is over, becoming overwhelming. So are you seeing any changes and hope in these structures? Yes. Well, not in those structures. See, I, the, you know, sometimes people say, well, my gosh, after you make these kinds of presentations, don't you want to just go curl in the fetal position and forget about it? And I, I do reach that point once in a while. It lasts for about 30 seconds and I'm back, all right? So, but the reason why I'm so excited right now is that while I will continue to work on legislation and with federal agencies and that sort of thing, because I think it's important to show up. I think if I don't participate, then we give the other side the ability to say, look, we asked her opinion and she was too busy. And so I'm going to continue to go there. But do I think that that is the solution? No. See, I think the solution is happening right here in this room. This is a grassroots thing. This is me telling you and you telling 100 people each and those people telling people until we reach the tipping point in this country where enough million people, and I don't know what that magic number is, know about this, that there is such a huge shift in the consumption patterns of people. And I'm talking about food, I'm also talking about medical services. I mean, when, when most women won't have mammograms anymore, we won't see mammography centers anymore, right? If people will not buy food raised in confinement facilities, they won't have any reason to exist anymore. They will go out of business. So where I think the excitement is, is watching the public wake up, members of the public, in meetings just like this one this weekend. And I can tell you from our own volume of email and phone calls and, and the number of people who are asking me to speak, we can hardly keep up. And that is very, very encouraging. So I think we're gaining on them. And you know, sometimes it's kind of fun because we're all practicing dietary excellence. We're gonna outlive our detractors. They're gonna be long gone, right? And there we will be, <laughs> promoting the message. <laughs> Okay. Dr. Popper, I have a question for you. I took the certification from Dr. Campbell, and you were one of the instructors in there. And if I recall very clearly, uh, there was a subject about soy. And you say, you know, the, if the person has cancer, you will recommend to avoid soy. Uh, so, not really. I, I said mm, that there, is, there are I some people myself. that, I, no, when it comes to breast cancer, particularly the, the, the scare is that uh, women with estrogen-fed breast cancer should avoid soy. And um, my answer to that is there are, there are some mixed studies out there, but generally speaking, if you look at what causes problems with women who have estrogen-positive uh, estrogen breast cancers, the things that affect that most are their body weight and body fat, fat consumption in the diet, lack of fiber in the diet. Um, and the consumption of animal foods, specifically dairy. That's where the action is in preventing the recurrence of breast cancer. And I get a little aggravated with my colleagues who will send an overweight woman eating an animal food-based diet home to avoid tofu. I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous misapplication of what, the, what we know scientifically causes estrogen-fed uh, breast cancers. So I don't, I'm not really concerned about cancer patients consuming soy. I'm very concerned about cancer patients consuming animal foods. And uh, I think that they're all candidates to be on a, on a completely plant-based diet. Right here? So. Yes, right here. Okay. I looked at your article, Searching Through the Medical Confusion, and that 
really brought to a point that I followed trying to determine what's the story about cholesterol for years. I followed mine, I can make it go up and down with diet, exercise, the HDL goes up. But all I read, there's nothing but confusion. It turns out 150, which we think is great, there's a lot of people die of heart problems at 150 level cholesterol. And looking at your articles and what you're saying, all the research has been debunked too about cholesterol, the myth of cholesterol. Homocysteine you brought up is a better indicator. Some people say there's all this confusion and now I've been told that I'm at my age, I don't have to worry about it that much. That's good, you know, I made it this far. But what is, in your mind, the truth about cholesterol? Well, I think cholesterol is a marker for not only heart disease, but also certain types of cancer, and that's what Colin Campbell's research showed. Um, I think, part, and again, this goes to what type of research you're going to rely on to make your conclusions. If I wanted to make a presentation today that cholesterol doesn't matter, there are studies that show that. But I'm much more intrigued with Dr. Esselstyn taking a group of patients who weren't supposed to live till the end of 1985, and they're still with us today. Two of them are in the film Forks Over Knives. And what he did to get those patients there, that's much more interesting to me. And we have no data from the people saying cholesterol doesn't matter that shows that their it doesn't matter program causes those results. And so if they come up with that data, I'll take a second look, but we don't have that right now. What, what makes you believe that it was the cholesterol level that made these people get better over the I think the cholesterol years? is just a marker. People don't die from, bad, from high cholesterol. The cholesterol is simply a marker for underlying uh, cardiovascular disease. It's a marker for damage to endothelial tissues, a, a tissue and atherosclerosis. It's just a marker. People don't die of high blood pressure. It's a marker for okay. cardiovascular okay. problems. And so when you eat a diet that normalizes those biomarkers, you, that's, that's, the, that's part of the effect. That's just a marker for the regeneration of endothelial tissue and the production of nitric oxide and the opening up of those arteries. The low cholesterol in and of itself isn't the deal. And that's why studies show that if you take red rice yeast extract or statin drugs, you're not really reducing your risk of heart attack, stroke, or all-cause mortality that much because that's an artificial lowering of the biomarker. I think that's one of the points that I'm making here. Lots of ways you can get to a particular end, but not all of them count. Tim Russert, great biomarkers, dead guy, all right? You don't want to be there. Okay, thanks. Okay. I know a few years back, uh, CoQ10 was really, really hot, and then ubiquinol became like the key, uh, I don't know, the sexy word <laughs> for people over like 25. Is that one of the supplements you would advise to um, take or not? Um, there aren't any supplements that I advise people to take all the time. Um, and, and the reason is because, first of all, we have, we have terrible evidence with supplements. I mean, you know, the, folate, the folate after coronary intervention trial uh, showed that people who had angioplasty, randomized to take folic acid or uh, placebo, the patients taking folic acid, their arteries were clogging up faster. They had to stop the study. And I could give you 30 more examples like that. And I think the interesting thing about these studies is that if you read them, they're not performed by people who are out to get the supplement industry. These, you read the abstract and, and it starts with something like, it's said that folic acid is helpful to people with cardiovascular disease. So we decided to do a trial to see if that's true. And it isn't, and they had to stop the study early, okay? So this isn't a conspiracy to, to undermine supplement sales. It's a, it's a scientific look at are the claims valid or not, and they're tending not to be true. So I think that when you're gonna take anything in your mouth, other than food, you know, if we're talking about eating broccoli or asparagus, go knock yourself out. But if we're talking about anything else, what you're gonna look at is what is the risk of doing this, and then what is the benefit? And the benefit better be pretty special to justify the risk, and there's a risk with any of it. Now, if you have a bacterial infection and it's gonna kill you, I strongly recommend an antibiotic, okay? We know that antibiotics destroy beneficial bacteria, but you'd rather be an alive person taking a probiotic, right, than a dead person with an intact gut. So there, the risk-benefit ratio starts to look pretty good. But you start looking at calcium, you start looking at CoQ10, you start looking at some of these other substances, and when they're prescribed for medical purposes, I mean, every doctor in this group here, in this, in this room right now, is using supplements for specific applications. I know Dr. Clapper does because we share patients. I know Dr. Furman does because we've shared patients. 
But that's different than the self-medicating of the sexy new thing is CoQ10, so I'm gonna get on the internet and buy some or get some when I go to the health food store. That's the mentality we're trying to get away from. Pam, I think we've got one more question here. Okay, I was just gonna say, you have to tell me when I'm finished because I don't wear a watch, which okay. reduces my stress but increases yours a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, doctor, you, you mentioned something before, just uh, alluded to it very quickly, and I'd like you to elaborate on it. And it was that um, in the discussion about cholesterol, that statins, taking statins lowers cholesterol, but it only has a marginal benefit. And I remember reading Dr. Esselstyn saying that he will personally guarantee that if anybody's got their cholesterol under 150, he guarantees they won't have a heart attack. But it didn't say in that statement whether or not you could get it down to that level with statins or you have to do it to get this guarantee, that is. You have to do it with, with diet and exercise. So I'd like you to elaborate on the statin issue. Well, my, my experience with, with cholesterol as well as everything else, you know, I'm often asked, will the diet work for me? And the odds are yes because genetic predisposition has so little to do with the whole issue. I mean, we know that genes are the determinant of your health, like two, three percent of the outcome, and the rest is choices that you make. Um, so in my family, you guys have heard me say this many times, and you saw it in Forks Over Knives, obesity runs in my family. Every woman on both sides of my family is obese for as long as we have pictures of them. I'm not, it's because I make different choices. So there's a difference between genes and genetic expression. So 97, 96, 97 percent of the time, if somebody adopts the diet you've been learning about this weekend, their cholesterol is going to ratchet right on down to that protective level. For the small percentage of people for whom that doesn't work, and I have some of them in my patient files, just like I'm sure some of you other physicians do too, um, it's of course prudent to recommend some type of either statin drug or high dose niacin or something of that nature, but, but that's a very tiny percentage of the population. I can say with a great deal of assurance for the vast majority of you here that if you do the things that you've heard about this weekend, that your biomarkers are going to get to protective levels, and not only are your biomarkers going to be uh, in, in range, but you're going to have a longer and healthier life too. So thank you very much.